close their microphone. Uh, and thank you. Thank you, everyone. So in a few seconds, we will start. But uh, for, for now, let me welcome everyone, or benvenuti. I'm very honored to host this panel discussion addressing extremism after the Taliban returned to Afghanistan. And uh, welcome to is watching us online and those in presence in Rome at the headquarters of the, the Gasperi Foundation. And welcome, of course, to our distinguished panelists. Um, first and foremost, uh, Mr. Andrin Raj, Senior Fellow at the Religion and Security Council, um, Southeast Asia Regional Director uh, of the International Association for Counterterrorism and Security Professional, uh, and Director of the Northern Counterterrorist Network. Welcome to, to Professor Saibu Issa, uh, Professor of History and Security Studies, Dean at the Faculty of Arts, uh, Letters and Social Science, and Director of the Center of Peace, Security, and Integration uh, at the University of Marwa in Cameroon. And also welcome to, Mr., uh, to Dr. Eli Abawun, uh, Senior Fellow at the Religion and Security Council, Director for the Middle East and North Africa programs at the United States Institute of Peace. We are very happy to have you with us. Uh, we also have with us uh, President Angelino Alfano, and before uh, giving him the floor for the introductory remarks, uh, I'll just like to say that this event is organized by the De Gasperi Foundation in the framework of its counter-extremism, terrorism, and radicalization program in cooperation with the Religion and Security Council, represented here today by its chairman, Emiliano Stornelli. Uh, thank you very much, Emiliano, for organizing this event with us. Emiliano will moderate the event with me from Rome, uh, where we are uh, live with some of the students of the political training school organized every year by the De Gasperi Foundations and others, uh, not only students, but also professional practitioners and uh, some military personnel is uh, online together with uh, many others. Um, as you know, uh, the format of these um, of these of this event is going to be uh, as following: um, we're going to have introduction remark by President Alfano, and then we will have a first round of uh, interventions by our speakers for ten minutes each, and then we will open the floor to um, to questions. Uh, without much further ado, I will give the floor to President Alfano. President Alfano, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Mattia, um, uh, to you, and uh, good evening, everyone. It is a pleasure to welcome uh, you all uh, this event organized by the Gasperi Foundation, the Counter Extremism, Terrorism, Radicalization Program, and our uh, good partner, the Religion and Security Council. Uh, the De Gasperi Foundation, as you uh, might know, um, has since its creation of focus, uh, its efforts towards educating young generations to uh, the values of democracy, freedom, Europeanism, and uh, transatlanticism. Uh, the values that we stand for could not be in a starker contrast with those animating extremists and terrorists worldwide. And uh, we strongly believe that it's fundamental in order to address the security issues linked to extremism and terrorism, to give our contribution in creating awareness on these topics and facilitate international cooperation to find better solution to them. Extremism and terrorism uh, are global threats and they request a global approach, a global approach that has to pass through not just creating the right environment for exchanging ideas on how to counter uh, them, but also through the efforts of explaining this phenomena, uh, their roots and characteristics to younger generations. It is thanks to initiatives like this that the Gasperi Foundation aims at building resilience in young generations to create a society that is better prepared to face the threats posed by an increasingly challenging world scenario. 
And this is uh, why I want uh, to thank Emiliano Stornelli, chairman of the Religion and Security Council, and uh, our Matteo Caniglia, coordinator of the Security and Geopolitical uh, Ge Geopolitics Desk at the, the Gasperi Foundation for organizing this event. Uh, um, I also would like to welcome and express my gratitude for being here, um, for uh, being here with us, uh, to our panelists just mentioned um, by, um, by Mattia Caniglia. Thank you, thank you to all of you to, um, to, to, to attend uh, and uh, to, for your accepting uh, the, 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 the hypothesis to attend to our meeting. And uh, these senior experts and practitioners from Asia, Africa, and Middle East uh, will examine uh, the repercussions of the latest tragic events in Afghanistan on the fight against radicalization and violent extremism in their respective geographical uh, areas, highlighting the security implications for the EU member states. Uh, the panelists, very, very prestigious panelists, uh, will also illustrate ongoing local programs and countermeasures put into effect uh, to prevent indoctrination and recruitment, especially among the uh, uh, youth. In our intentions, uh, their views and insight uh, will serve not only as food for thought for uh, European decision and policy makers, but also as a source of knowledge uh, for, the, uh, for the young people involved in the, the Gasperi Foundation uh, Political Training School, EU People 2021. Uh, so, 20 years after 9-11, uh, with the Western uh, withdrawn from Afghanistan, the challenges posed uh, by the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic and by the fourth industrial revolution shifting the global dynamics and the returning threat of nuclear proliferation, uh, terrorism appears to have been demoted to a second tier priority. Uh, it is true that in 20 years and more of global war on terror, positive results were achieved. The strongest jihadi groups are today limited operationally. And in many cases, jihadi franchise groups are preoccupied with local and regional conflicts and civil wars. Neither Al-Qaeda nor the Islamic State has developed into a mass movement, uh, as the uh, vast majority of uh, Muslims worldwide still harbor uh, negative views of jihadi organization, uh, are co according uh, to polling data. Western state also became better not just encountering terrorism, but encountering the radicalization. However, complacency is dangerous. Um, while uh, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State have been uh, weakened, their affiliates and branches uh, remain active in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, in the Sahel, the Horn, and other parts of Africa. And uh, even though uh, the violent excesses of Islamic State rule in Syria and Iraq disgusted very many Muslims, um, jihadi ideology continues to resonate uh, throughout the Arab and Islamic world, fueled by a lack of political and economic progress and sectarian animosities. The fall of Kabul uh, and uh, the perception of a dramatic victory over a second superpower in Afghanistan has a sent a jolt of energy through the global jihad movement. And as others have noted, less pressure could equal more terror. According to the UN monitoring team report published in uh, July 2021, the United States military withdrawal and the partial drawdown of the African Union mission in Somalia 
left uh, Somali special forces struggling to contain Al Shabaab without strategic support, while in the Sahel, JNIM is expanding as France reduces its military efforts against the Chiais. Uh, as a Western counter terrorism efforts suicide, with uh, resources shifted to other geopolitical and economic challenges, the global jihadi movement could be able of mounting a comeback. The chaotic uh, scenes uh, that followed the uh, Taliban takeover of Kabul will be used by jihadis to evoke images of the Soviets departing the graveyard of empires more than 30 years ago. Uh, Osama bin, Laden, bin Laden's assessment of the United States as a paper tiger following the US withdrawal uh, from Somalia in the early 1990s will receive new attention. And the Taliban's late summer 2021 takeover of Afghanistan will be offered as proof uh, that uh, by staying the course, uh, Al-Qaeda and its jihadi allies have prevailed, bleeding the United States economically and setting the conditions for US disengagement from the, from the Arab and Islamic world, something that Bin Laden and his jihadi contemporaries have long shared among their top priorities through an endless stream of propaganda and information uh, uh, operations. So uh, with new battlefields in Africa and uh, the potential for Afghanistan now back under Taliban control to once again become a magnet for foreign fighters, there is a significant risk of a jihadi resurgence. Jihadi uh, terrorist organizations are undergoing a process of decentralization, which is also behind their spread in Africa, the Middle East and in um, and Asia in contests where they balance local and global objectives with local grievances, including economic stagnation, high rates of youth unemployment and demographic pressures, all factors that have contributed to recruitment and mobilization among Muslim youth in the past. Demographics, socioeconomic conditions, youth culture, geopolitical context, and poor governance all matter as drivers of extremism and as noted by a study looking at the next generation of, of uh, uh, Salafi jihadis, the underlying grievances that draw radicalization in past generations of, <coughs> of Sunni Muslims uh, remain salient in Jin Zib. One reason more to engage young people on this issue. Finally, the issue of radicalization requires an in-depth analysis as combating radicalization is one of the modern challenges currently facing Europe and the entire world, which are called upon to provide a strong shared response. I am sure our speakers will provide more insight on these topics. However, it is useful to clarify how the mere tightening of repressive security and intelligence measures does not seem to be able to overcome the risks associated with the phenomenon of radicalization. Following the European model, it seems necessary to support these instruments with the adoption of innovative measures of prevention and counteraction aimed at preventing vulnerable people from approaching radical ideas and rehabilitating those who have already crossed the risk threshold by embracing the cause of violent extremism. In order to do this in the most effective way possible, we need to learn what other countries are doing in this regard, 
learn from their best practices and engage in dialogue with them as there is only one way to address a global threat and it is to have a global approach. Dialogues like uh, the one that this event will provide room for are therefore not only necessary, but fundamental. And to conclude, the global jihadi extremist movement has survived onslaught from arguably the most powerful military coalition in modern history. And while its transnational stature has been diminished, the movement has gained both local and regional influence. It remains a determined foe and the jihadi ideology continues to resonate, providing a renewable resource. Despite jihadi terrorist battlefield losses, their ideology still inspires homegrown violent extremists in the West to launch attacks. It is a threat that is still there. And to paraphrase Alcide de Gasperi, encountering it, we cannot rest on tenuous expedients. Do not delude yourselves with a momentary lull or with unstable compromises. Instead, we need to keep on aiming at the ideal goal of defeating extremism and terrorism and make a tenacious um, and generous effort to reach it. To make these generous efforts, we also need your engagement and participation in events like this one. Uh, I hope you will enjoy the discussion and thank you again for your attention and for being with us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Alfano, and I think your interesting remarks will help us uh, frame with the discussion in, uh, in the right framework. Um, and uh, without further ado, I will give the floor to Emiliano, which will introduce our first speaker of the day. As I said before, there will be um, the interventions of, for the, the first round of intervention for 10 minutes each by our three speakers. And Emilian, Emiliano, back to you in Rome. Thank you very much, Mattia, and uh, thanks, President Alfano, for, uh, for your uh, remarks, and thanks to uh, the Gasperi Foundation for cooperating with the Regional Security Council in the organization of this important event. And I want to uh, extend my, uh, my gratefulness also, also to our uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, who accepted our invitation to uh, to be here uh, today? Their presence presence for us is uh, is very important. We discussed a lot about uh, uh, the approach that we wanted to uh, to take in organizing this event on uh, Afghanistan, and uh, we decided that we wanted to uh, give room to the the, the viewpoints, to uh, the uh, perspective of um, experts and practitioners coming from other uh, areas of uh, the world, uh, areas other than, uh, other than Europe, like uh, Asia, uh, Africa, and, uh, and the Middle East, which are uh, affected even more than uh, Europe by uh, radicalization and uh, violent extremism, uh, out of the conviction that uh, uh, ourselves as uh, uh, security uh, analysts and researchers in, uh, in Europe, we, uh, we need uh, the, the, the insights, we need uh, the first-hand knowledge of uh, colleagues, of experts from uh, these, these regions of, uh, of the world in order to uh, help us to get to uh, a better uh, and deeper understanding of uh, how to uh, address uh, radicalization and violent extremism also in Europe and more broadly the nexus between uh, religion and, uh, and security. And uh, because this uh, will provide us uh, with uh, valuable food, food for thought uh, as uh, policymakers and uh, researchers while uh, addressing uh, the, the issue of radicalization and violent extremism here in our uh, European uh, countries. And uh, so I'm uh, glad to introduce the, the first speaker, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Henry Raj. Um, 
who has been part of uh, uh, the uh, enterprise of the Revision and Security Council since the very beginning in uh, 2016 and in his uh, multiple uh, capacities. Uh, which were uh, recalled by uh, President Alfano. Uh, let me say that he uh, uh, is a, a unique position. He com perfectly combines uh, Asia and the uh, European uh, perspective because with this uh, organization is uh, very engaged in countering radicalization and violent extremism in Asia, South Southeast Asia in particular, but also in, uh, uh, in Europe. And uh, uh, Andrin, so uh, thank you very much for uh, being here. And uh, I hope that you can uh, listen to, to me correctly. Hello, Andrin. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, really okay, am. great, great to see you, although virtually. And uh, so uh, with your organization, uh, you personally, you have taken a, a strong stance uh, concerning uh, the, um, the return to power of the Taliban in, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, you uh, spoken uh, out loud regarding the actual uh, Taliban uh, ideology and the impact of the um, Taliban movement uh, across uh, Asia, not only in uh, Southwest and Southeast Asia, but also in other, uh, in other spots of, this, of, the, of the Asian uh, continent. And uh, so, can you tell us more about your uh, your view? And uh, do you think that uh, we should be expecting more radicalization and violent extremism coming uh, across Asia due to uh, the, the comeback of the Taliban in Afghanistan? All right. <clears throat> thank you, Emil. I know first I'd like to thank uh, President Alfano and the two organizations for having me on board. Uh, I will start off with a couple of uh, uh, notifications, uh, pointers. Um, what are we actually fighting uh, or what are we actually addressing? We talk about radicalization, we talk about extremism, and then when we go down the line, we mention about ISIS, we mention about Al Qaeda. So the first thing we need to do is to address what we are addressing, which is on our side, Islam is countering terrorism, Islam is countering narratives. So if we do not identify what we are addressing, forget about the point about talking about radicalization and extremism. Um, I, I know many uh, scholars, academics would like to do this due to the fact of funding and supporting political views. But uh, as terrorism researchers, we need to be uh, stand fast on this. Now, with regards to um, uh, the European Union on the Taliban, we need to be clear that the Taliban is a radical and extremist organization. It is trying to have recognition from the European Union, it's trying to have recognition from Muslim countries, Southeast Asia and the Sahel African region on its uh, Islamic Arab uh, Emirates of Afghanistan. Now, we also have to understand that the Taliban practices violent Sharia laws. So that is in ways uh, against uh, European Union's human rights uh, issues. So we need to address this before we can jump into recognizing. Today, I will tell you this. The Taliban has a dossier of all Mujahideens that fought during the Russian war. And they are utilizing former Mujahideens who have now gone back to their home countries in Southeast Asia, uh, Africa, the European Union, uh, to use political influence for recognition. So you will have uh, many organizations, uh, diaspora communities supporting this. We did um, uh, research just last week in Helsinki, Finland, 50% of Muslims are sympathizers. They are not radicals, they are not terrorists, but they sympathize towards uh, the uh, plight of uh, issues pertaining to Muslim communities. And that's very, very alarming. Um, many research in, in Helsinki, Finland has, has, has never shown this. We went down to the roots. Uh, we spoke with Iraqis, uh, Kurdish, uh, Kurdish uh, 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 citizens, Iranians, uh, you name it. And, and it was different perspective. Now, how are we going to address this? In Southeast Asia, the Taliban has been glorified by far right political religious groups supporting the takeover of the Taliban. And um, this, this is very concerning because uh, what we are seeing here is the support of radical 
extremist views uh, being propagated by the Taliban, as well as Sharia, strict violent Sharia compliance. What terrorism scholars fail to understand when they address Islamist counter narratives or Islamist terrorism um, is that they do not identify the Sharia compliance, the strict Sharia compliance, as well as the cosmic war. It is a cosmic war. When, when Islamist terrorists blow up something or, uh, or attack something, they always say Allah Akbar. So Allah Akbar is referring to a God. It, it is a cosmic thing that is powered behind them. So we need to understand the cosmic war that is actually transpiring within Islamist uh, counter narratives, uh, or sorry, Islamist narratives towards uh, ideologies uh, that are being propagated. This is something that I, I have not seen when uh, terrorism scholars talk about um, uh, Islamist terrorism or countering Islamist uh, narratives. So these are a few factors that are common mistakes uh, that we are so sensitive about, but we are only lying to ourselves if we don't address this. Prior to 9-11 or pre-9-11, the war on terror was on countering Islamist terrorism, which was actually a, a, ter a religious uh, issues where misinterpretations were, uh, were taking precedence. We're not fighting seven-day evangelists or, or uh, Hindu extremism globally today. We are fighting a religious misinterpretation of a religion. So we need to be concentrated on that. Governments may want to support the Taliban, governments can come in, but that's, that's the political point of view. We as scholars, terrorism researchers need to be steadfast in our principles, what is right and what is wrong. Uh, we have also concerns of terrorism researchers being sympathizers to the Taliban or even to uh, far-right Islamist groups. And we have identified these researchers and we are very cautious when we want to work with them because we may not get the right um, identification or the right uh, tools to address these issues because there's a sympathizing uh, mindset that the religion has been mocked by Western community or any other uh, uh, community for that matter. So we need to uh, be sure of what we're actually addressing when we talk about Islamist terrorism or radicalization or extremism. In Southeast Asia, uh, in Indonesia, the Ulama Council where we work with, and I'm sure my country director is on uh, online today, um, <clears throat> we have a, a, a set of team that actually monitors 500 platforms, social media to counter the narratives of Islamist ideology in the state of Indonesia today. As we speak, Indonesia is seemingly one of the most uh, appropriate uh, countries that are actually addressing Islamist terrorism as it is, not hiding behind the curtain and being uh, um, sensitive towards the, the, the issue. Uh, the government is taking a, a strong stand on, on addressing this. You don't have a, a, a threat precursor for uh, foreign uh, researchers going into Indonesia to learn about this, to understand about this, so they can take it back home to understand what's transpiring in countries in Southeast Asia. So we, we've seen the, the push-pull factor of the, the Western scholars. Uh, why I say Western scholars? Because I come from the American school of thought and we think differently. Um, Western scholars have uh, the push-pull factors and, and many of these push-pull factors are, are just descriptive. Um, you, you have to be uh, able to live to understand the Muslim community, the socialization uh, of, of cultures uh, in understanding why uh, certain communities, certain diaspora communities become uh, sympathizers. They're not terrorists. Each one of us are radicals in our own ways, in our own means. So we can't say that uh, just being a, a radical, you, you are a, a terrorist. Now, going back to 2015, when I was in Kyrgyz, uh, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, it was uh, the first conference that the Kyrgyz government was concerned on Islamization and, and terrorism. And, uh, and there was a panel of international uh, organizations sitting there. And the first thing I asked them is, what are you guys addressing? Radicalization, extremism, we are here in Kyrgyzstan. 
I don't see uh, the seven day evangelists uh, uh, hitting against the Kyrgyz government. So we need to address what we are focusing on. Just say radicalization, extremism, you know, so what? It, it's no big deal whether you're a scholar, you're a government. Uh, everybody wants to play to the tune. But I hope that we, we come to a point of addressing this uh, in reality. Uh, today, many forms of religions are taking extremism and, and, and radicalization in their, their own ways, whether it's for uh, you know, violence or whether it's in a different propaganda, uh, we need to address it based on the focus identity. I hope that kind of sums up what uh, we are talking about. But however, we see the Taliban is a radical extremist group, which is using violent Sharia to uh, propagate their ideologies uh, in, 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 in Afghanistan. And Europe cannot afford to just recognize it just like that. And then it means that Europe is just failing on its own, uh, what you call this uh, human rights violations. Similarly, in, in Asia, we, we can't expect uh, much of these because you have Muslim countries where uh, dominance of po political religious parties who are taking precedence and supporting the Taliban. So governments need to address this. We as terrorism researchers and experts need to be steadfast in addressing this on our own. Uh, forget about being politically correct, sensitive, or you know where the funding is coming for you to fit into one piece on and, and the other. Uh, it, it you know 25 years ago when I first started uh, counterterrorism, uh, the network was very small. Today you've got you know names that I've never even heard of. Uh, I, I still call myself the director or senior researcher, and uh, you know today you have like counter radicalization expert, and I don't see if all these have had many uh, years of expertise in addressing these kinds of issues. But let's let's be um, realistic in what we are doing and how to address this. Recognizing the Taliban in the near future is not the way to go because it's only going to fuel Islamist ideologies in Europe and it will give them the power to propagate what they feel they want to do. So I hope that answers uh, uh, your your question, Emiliano. Yes, you did, Andrin, actually. And uh, uh, you uh, have drawn a quite disturbing uh, picture of uh, the situation. And that's why I would like to uh, ask you another question. Mattia, do you have uh, two more minutes, I think, for a. Uh, yes, please. Uh, yeah, you can reply please, please. by two tweets, a couple of tweets to reply to uh, the question I'm going to pose you. Uh, In a nutshell, uh, Mr. Andrin. Andrin, are there countermeasures that should be uh, taken uh, in order to uh, address this possible rise of uh, radicalization uh, due to the Taliban uh, come back in Afghanistan? What kind of countermeasures can be taken? The first countermeasures, uh, if you're talking about Europe, you need to make sure that the researcher understands the Quran, the Islamist ideologies, Islamist teachings. I, I bet many of us may not have understood where did uh, ISIS come out with its first video. Uh, in 2014, when ISIS came out with their uh, video, it was chapter 32 verses one to nine that they use of the Quranic teachings. So if terrorism scholars don't know what uh, propagandas is being used and how to identify uh, the narratives from the Quran uh, with regular terrorism researcher, you will fail to understand Islamist narratives. It's easy to say that, oh yeah, you know, um, ISIS have taken this, 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 uh, Al-Qaeda has taken this, 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 this. No, uh, everybody knows that. But um, it seems like Al-Qaeda is still growing. Al-Qaeda has been the forefront of the Taliban takeover during the fall of Kabul when US uh, troops moved out. There was in, in uh, inclusion of Al-Qaeda forces, the Taliban is a guerrilla warfare group. They have never been taught in urban warfare. It's Al-Qaeda that had this expertise. So as long as the Taliban doesn't denounce Al-Qaeda, Europe should be cautious of this. You need to denounce something before you want to accept something. So identifying the narratives, the, the religion itself, I mean, we grew up in, in our own religious uh, aspects. I, I grew up to be a Christian, but do I know the Bible by heart? No, I don't. Uh, 
so similar with Muslims too, uh, not all read the Quran or understand the Quran. We grew up because of our family upbringing. So the family is prior important in the Muslim community because Sharia compliance is very, very adamant in addressing situation. So we need to understand Islamist narratives based on the Quran and the ideologies being used, not just big pull push factors of economic uh, alienation. Hey, everybody is alienation. Everybody goes through uh, racism somehow or rather. I mean, we deal with it. Uh, so how do we actually address assimilation? Assimilation in Europe has got nothing to do with language. There's, there's, no, there's nothing that tells you that assimilating into a language will benefit you in the long run. No, it doesn't. You've got to assimilate in culture and society to be able to adapt into a community. So countering narratives and what's transpiring in Europe um, is very, very sensitive uh, in, in sense of this. So I, I, I hope I touched on it, Emiliano. And if you have, thank you. Thank you so much. But then we can also expound this topic during the discussion time when we let some time to, to deepen this, uh, these issues. Um, so, uh, Mattia, uh, we want to shift to uh, the second remarks with uh, Professor Issa Saibu on Africa. Yes, yes, Emiliano. Um, actually, thank you, Mr. 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 Raj. Very interesting remarks. Um, let's go to Professor Saibu also like to touch to bring the well to address the elephant in the room a little bit because Africa in the past years has become the epicenter of uh, of jihadist terrorism worldwide. We have uh, we have seen to a surge in activities, not only in the Sahel, but also in the Horn of Africa and in Sub-Saharan Africa. For instance, the newcomer is uh, the Islamist insurgency in Mozambique. But Professor uh, Saibu, you are a leading expert on violent extremist groups in West Africa, focusing particularly on the Lake Chad Basin countries, uh, where Boko Haram, Islamic State in the Western Africa province, uh, and Al-Qaeda are um, operational. Um, what is the situation in the Lake Chad Basin and how do you think the Taliban's return might affect the trajectory of these groups in your region and in Africa? Okay, thank you very much and uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, session. Uh, you gave me 10 minutes to, to uh, sum up uh, the situation in uh, the Sahel in general, but especially in the Chad Basin region where I am uh, located, especially in, uh, in Cameroon. Uh, as you know, uh, the Chad Basin region and uh, the uh, uh, Sahel zone, areas where we find especially uh, Al-Qaeda affiliates and uh, Islamic State's uh, affiliates, uh, but we also have violent community-based organizations which are going on in crime, ethnic warfare, but and lose or direct linkages uh, to uh, terrorist uh, groups. We have two main strategic zones there. The first uh, zone is uh, the Iktapo Burma area, which is uh, at the border between Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso. And you have the Chadbezi region, uh, which is shared by Cameroon, Niger, Nigeria, and uh, Chad. In uh, both areas, we had uh, we have regional responses against violent extremism and especially against uh, terrorist attacks. These are the G5 Sahel Joint Force and the International Joint Task uh, Force. What we can observe is that um, there is more financial and military engagement of European nations in the Sahel, whereas uh, in the Chad Basin region, uh, violent extremism response is sponsored, fund, funded by uh, uh, national budget, mainly by national budget. In the Sahel, state difficulties to curb terrorism led to uh, political uh, turmoil and military coups. Uh, in Chad Basin, Debbie's demise uh, is considered as a source of fragility for counterterrorism. But globally speaking, Boko Haram's political agenda is uh, mainly vanishing. The demise of Shekau and uh, Itwab's attempt to merge factions failed, 
So now we are deeply in uh, to in fightings which are going on. What we can observe right now in the Chad Basin region is that uh, since the demise of uh, Bubakar uh, Shikau some months ago, uh, Al Barnawi, who uh, was the leader of uh, the Islamic State in West Africa province, tried to merge uh, the different Boko Haram factions, that is the Jama'a to the Ali Sunnah Lidawati Wal Jihad, uh, which is uh, uh, Shikau's faction, the Bakura faction, which is um, uh, acting in the like, Chad uh, zone, especially in the border between Niger and, uh, and Chad, which was uh, close to uh, Shekau. But um, uh, when Iswap tried to uh, take over uh, Shekau's territory, and especially the Sambisa forest, they went into fighting with the Bakura group, and until now, they uh, continue to, to fight. So the consequence of this situation is that uh, uh, part of the Shikau guys surrendered to the Nigerian army, to Niger, or to Cameroon, and uh, others went to join uh, Bakura uh, in Lake Chad zone, and uh, another group either trying to escape or trying to comply with uh, uh, the uh, Islamic State in West Africa province uh, needs or desires within the Sambisa forest. So, uh, concretely speaking, what we observe is that uh, uh, neither group is uh, strong. The uh, Shekau group uh, is uh, disappearing. The Bakura group is not uh, so uh, tough to be able to uh, take over uh, the um, uh, Chad Basin uh, uh, zone and uh, the uh, Iswab uh, with uh, Al Barnawi's group is uh, not also able to uh, control the area. And uh, of recent, we learned from uh, the Nigerian military that uh, Abu Bakar uh, Al Barnawi, not Shekau, but Al Barnawi, uh, died some days ago. So the consequences of this situation is that uh, we have both attacks by Iswat's groups on uh, the armies of. Nigeria and Cameroon cow guys who continue to go on for crime because they lack food, they lack uh, medicines, and uh, the area where they used to live is uh, occupied by uh, the Iswap uh, people. But uh, more of that is uh, the number of people, especially ex fighters, their, their, uh, their, their, their wives and children who uh, escaped and surrendered to the governments in a context whereby the DDR programs which were uh, implemented or being implemented in the area are not that successful. In Niger, it was expected that uh, through the Gudumaria project, they would be able to uh, 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 let more uh, ex-fighters uh, surrendering but uh, they didn't get up to 200. And uh, at the end of the day, they realized that the DDR process was not uh, so uh, successful in uh, uh, reducing uh, the number of fighters who are still in the bush. In Nigeria, Operation Safe Corridor is going on, of course, but uh, of recent, we have heard and we learned that um, um, some politicians were not uh, really uh, uh, joyful in seeing uh, those guys who graduated from uh, the Gudumaria Center coming back to the communities because the communities are wondering why uh, the government is taking care of uh, these guys who uh, destroyed, killed, and threatened their lives. And uh, they are coming back as heroes while uh, they who were victims are not uh, being taken care of uh, uh, appropriately. In Cameroon, it is the same situation in the DDR uh, process. So what we observe uh, these days and even yesterday is that uh, on a daily basis, you have children, you have uh, uh, women and their wives, husbands coming out either as uh, ex-associates or ex-fighters. Uh, now, what uh, we can learn from uh, those guys who are coming back is that uh, even the concept of radicalization and the motivation 
need to be readdressed in order really to understand things not only on a doctrinal basis that is uh, on, in the, on the indoctrination process, but also try to look at things as uh, how local uh, uh, leaders, but also how personal conflicts, how the interpretation of, uh, of life itself was uh, at the basis of uh, the behaviors of these people who didn't understand the difference between uh, one tendency or, or, or the other. Originally, uh, those guys who were living with Shekau were so comfortable with him because they, were, they, they used to say that uh, they were living in what they called Daula Musulunchi, that is uh, the country of the Muslims. And uh, uh, with uh, Al Barnawi, they could not have the same possibility to do what they used to do, that is not paying tax, uh, that is uh, being able to uh, organize attacks and get uh, some food, some money, and continue their daily life without having necessarily to get an, an, an identity card or a birth certificate uh, because Chicago told them that uh, all these are not uh, uh, relevant. The second dimension of that is uh, it, it appears clearly that our countries, that is the four countries surrendering the, um, uh, the Chad Basin, had uh, very, very tough uh, uh, situations in their border zones, which is because uh, cross border interactions, which were positive before, have been transformed by the uh, violent extremists as a tool in order to capture the territory, but also be able to use the transactions, the former transactions, in order to fund their, their, their activities and create their virtual uh, states. So, in uh, such a context, uh, it is not uh, surprising that uh, what uh, is happening in Afghanistan looks like uh, very remote to the uh, communities. Remote because, first of all, uh, whatever is being debated there is debated uh, in, uh, in French language or in English language. And uh, most of these uh, people living in the border zones where uh, terrorist activity is uh, more present, they are not, uh, they don't understand neither French nor English, they don't read newspapers. Most of the time, they uh, watch TVs where programs are in Hausa language and uh, not even uh, programs in, uh, uh, in, in Arabic uh, language. Secondly, uh, since Chicago disappeared, we don't see clearly who is the leader of Boko Haram in the area. And then uh, the, the, the way they communicate is not. Uh, uh, as audible as uh, could uh, be uh, Chicago. Of course, uh, ISWAP and uh, uh, ISIS have a very tight connection, especially in terms of accompanying communication strategy. But uh, this, uh, the, the impact of this communication is not uh, that uh, visible. We observe that uh, when the Taliban uh, returned to power in Afghanistan, uh, some ulamas and uh, uh, Islamic organize, Islamist organizations in Africa, North Africa, Central Africa, and uh, uh, the Sahel uh, congratulated the Taliban. They congratulated them, and uh, there is not even uh, a particular uh, obedience tendency which congratulated them, but all tendencies did. And uh, the, the perception of the Taliban's return there is uh, most, mostly linked to what uh, some are calling the new decolonization, because they consider that uh, what is happening in Afghanistan is not different to what could happen in uh, Mali. And uh, in some newspapers, there was this comparison with uh, the Al Qaeda's uh, attempt at uh, overthrowing the government and especially controlling the territory in 2012, leading uh, uh, France to intervene through uh, what is called the, the Serval uh, operation. And uh, in this country and other countries in West Africa, it is considered that now 
foreign intervention is considered by the, uh, what need to be addressed and what need to be fought because uh, it is not only a matter of Islam but it is a matter of uh, free, liberating and intervention. Of course, you understand that. Uh, uh, professor, you are breaking. They are uh, faking things because they are uh, just exploiting. Sorry. Yes, Professor, you're breaking. So we didn't, we didn't get your last phrase because you were breaking. The connection um, froze for a second. Would you repeat your last phrase, please? Yeah, I was I was saying that. Uh, are you hearing me now? Yes. Yeah, I was saying that uh, in these uh, uh, countries, especially what we observe in uh, in Mali, is that uh, uh, the Islamist groups they are considering, and even not only the Islamist group, but uh, among the youth, they are considering what happened in Afghanistan <clears throat> as exactly the same of what uh, would have happened in Mali if. Uh, 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 France didn't intervene. But uh, as long as France intervention is uh, taking time there, and uh, with what is going on now, the change in France's uh, uh, presence in Mali, that is from a, a France-led operation to the Takuba uh, led uh, to the Takuba, that is European Union-led intervention, would uh, show that uh, we are moving, or they are moving towards what they call a second decolonization. And I think that uh, what is like we observed here is that uh, uh, on the, uh, in the Sahel and in the Chad Basin region especially, uh, the impression is that uh, where uh, foreign intervention, and foreign intervention is not only European intervention, but uh, it is also the Chadians who are going to the Sahel, coming from Central Africa to go to uh, the, the Sahel are considered as well foreign interventions. Then all these foreign interventions shows that uh, where they are coming, uh, terrorist attack is uh, wider. Terrorist at attack is uh, more powerful when compared to what is going on in the Chad Basin region, where you have uh, almost uh, no uh, direct intervention by uh, foreign foreign troops because uh, uh, local forces, national forces, are the one. Uh, fighting Al Qaeda in the in the in the region. So um, what I think to now is that uh, um, in the Chad Basin region, especially uh, the communities, the states, and regional organizations have understood that to address radicalization, to address violent extremism. Uh, is uh, to take into consideration two main parameters. The first parameter is that uh, 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 terrorism is indigenizing. What I call indigenization here is that uh, the, uh, the sources, the actors, and the modalities are mostly locally got some interactions with Al Qaeda, with ISIS, with people who uh, from 2009 till 2016 went to Mali in order to, to learn how to fight, in order to get more communication tools, in order to uh, learn how to uh, uh, manufacture uh, uh, explosives and so on and so forth. But uh, concretely on the field, what we realize in the Chad Basin region is that uh, almost all those who are acting there are from the region. So indigenization means that uh, local uh, economic and so on and so forth uh, carried, designed, debated by local actors in order to go on for local agendas is uh, at the forefront of uh, the de development of extremism in the, in the area. This is why sometimes when we say terrorism, uh, people doesn't, doesn't really follow and understand it this way because they think that uh, it is just a, a, a matter of, uh, of, of words and that uh, it is not that they are on terrorism, they are on uh, uh, social, uh, rebellion. 
So the second factor is uh, that. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, professor, but uh, we we need to. Sorry, professor, but we need to conclude. So I'm concluding. Could, perf perfect. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry. concluding uh, by saying that uh, with the chat basin commission, what we realized this uh, last days is that uh, from um, their point of view, we need to move onto community-based reinstation and reintegration processes in order to connect to local problems, address local issues, and local responses involving the communities into the process of stabilization. Thank you. No, thank you, Professor. I work with uh, with the Sahel myself, and I know that it's um, it's never easy to um, to describe the situation in the Sahel and in um, the Lake Bay in the Lake Chad Basin uh, in ten minutes. So thank you for accepting uh, the struggle. Uh, if I could just ask you, and if you could answer me really in a tweet. Uh, in the past days, we have been talking a lot about uh, rising Russian um, presence in the Sahel. Do you think this will deteriorate further the situation or, or not? Just in a tweet. No, of course, uh, from what we can read in uh, Mali, especially in the two major tendencies, there are those who think that uh, no matter what they can and think about the French or about the Europeans, traditional European uh, powers uh, acting in Africa, it is necessary to, uh, it is better to continue uh, uh, working uh, and acting with them because they are able to mobilize an organization and that it is better to work with an organization uh, that is through European Union uh, instead of uh, working with a, a country. Secondly, uh, most of those who uh, at the intellectual level can analyze the situation understand that uh, it is hard to think that uh, where the states have not been able to uh, 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 to counter terrorism that is uh, uh, what they call a mercenary group uh, would, uh, would do so. Uh, the third thing I would like to say is that it is not only about Russia now, it is also about Turkey which is uh, knocking at uh, doors, maybe through a soft, soft approach. But uh, globally uh, speaking, uh, from my own perspective, I'm not sure that uh, uh, people are considering that uh, Russian presence is uh, uh, lasting and that it is able to take care of uh, the strategic situation in the Sahel for long. So uh, the is uh, a need of uh, real politics. And from the ground, it is observed as if the attitude of them to push uh, the Europeans to act more in order to go further in fighting the Europeans. Thank you, Professor. Um, and I actually, I will hope that you're right on this. And uh, we are a bit, um, I would say, fashionably late uh, and perfectly adhering to the Italian cliche. So the ball is back to you in Rome, Emiliano, for introducing and asking the question to Dr. Habawan. Thanks, Mattia, and thank Professor Sabu for your extraordinary presentation. And uh, so now from uh, Asia and Africa, we shift to, uh, to the Middle East, to the uh, MENA region, uh, where uh, we have uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Elia Wawu waiting for us. And he's a um, senior fellow at the Regional Security Council and uh, director of uh, Middle East and North Africa programs at the United States Institute of Peace. Yeah, he's uh, based in Tunis and uh, is a um, Lebanese by origin and he supervises and uh, conducts uh, many programs, cooperation programs in the region in very sensitive contexts and countries like Libya, Egypt, Iraq. So he's very acquainted and familiar with uh, uh, the, the security and political processes on, uh, currently ongoing in the, uh, in the region and of course also about developments within uh, the uh, uh, militant circles and uh, radical groups. So uh, thank you, Ali, for uh, uh, for being with us, and uh, I hope that you can uh, you can hear me from there. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, 
kickstart your uh, your session with uh, with a question. Uh, it's about the uh, reaction of uh, Islamist movements and jihadist groups uh, to the uh, uh, Taliban's comeback in, uh, in Afghanistan, um, uh, in the MENA region, of course. Do you, do you, do you think that they feel uh, more emboldened now in promoting their narratives and, uh, and discourse? And do you think that uh, they can gain more uh, popularity and uh, consensus at mainstream level, uh, thus uh, uh, enhancing uh, the possibility to uh, 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 further radicalization and violent extremism in the region? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Emiliano, and thank you for all the organizers. Uh, Mr. Mati, I don't want, I don't know if you want the Lebanese to address a situation of delay in the in the timing. But anyway, I'll try my best uh, to answer your it's question. It's a good mix. <laughs> yes, uh, Emiliano. So to answer your question, yes, actually, you know, the short answer is that yes, uh, most of the jihadist groups now uh, they found in what happened in Afghanistan an opportunity to. Uh, to strengthen a little bit or to solidify their messaging towards their constituencies uh, in, you know, in different parts of, of, the, of the region. Uh, they think that uh, you know, the success of Taliban in Afghanistan or the Taliban's takeover of Kabul or the rest of Afghanistan uh, might actually help them uh, recruit more people. Uh, so, and basically the idea they're using is that, uh, you know what, democracy didn't work, uh, and they give examples of Egypt and Tunisia and the Palestinian territories where some Islamist movements reached uh, the, the government through elections, uh, elections with a question mark, but elections nevertheless. Uh, and yet they were ousted from the government uh, by what, you know, by any definition is a non-democratic mean. Uh, so, and now they compare the situation to Kabul and they say, you, you know, you see, uh, we tried the election, we tried to the democratic path, it didn't work. Uh, we were uh, eliminated by force, but apparently if we use force ourselves, maybe things will be better and look as Kabul as an example. So this is, if I want to simplify a little bit how they're trying to recover their popularity, this is what they're using. Uh, and of, of course, uh, people who felt uh, uh, marginalized or excluded by what happened in some countries that I mentioned before. Uh, so these people who have an Islamist background, they might be sensitive to this discourse. Uh, so there are already some early indications of this, uh, of, you know, of uh, an upscale, up, uh, of a surge, sorry, in the, in the recruitment. Uh, in, uh, in my recent trip to Iraq, I got to learn, uh, although I was not able to confirm from uh, you know, official sources, but I got to learn from usually reliable sources that there are some fighters uh, already recruited from rural Sulaymaniyah and Halabja, which is, uh, these are two areas in Northern Iraq. Uh, so some people were uh, recruited from these parts of Northern Iraq and uh, they were, uh, you know, Told they will go to Afghanistan to join the ranks of Taliban. Now, I don't know the scale of this. It might be a few individual cases. It might be the start of a larger uh, pattern. Uh, but uh, this is something I thought I would share with this group. Uh, and uh, of course, I'll keep you posted if I learn more about it. Uh, in Syria, we know that, uh, <clears throat> you know, Hayat Tahrir Sham stated their desire to replicate the Taliban's takeover. Uh, I don't know if they have the means to do it. There are a lot of geopolitical dynamics in Syria, but still they are trying to uh, revive their constituency by using this discourse. Uh, <clears throat> you know, other armed groups such as Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and the Houthis in Yemen are also taking notes uh, and uh, and you know exploring what how they can use the events in Afghanistan to their own uh, advantage. If you take, you know, I take one example in Lebanon, for example, one of the key leaders, Sheikh Hashim Safiuddin, who was the head of the executive council, uh, which is basically the legislative body of Hezbollah versus Hassan Nasrallah, who leads the executive body. So Sheikh Safiuddin stated uh, in, you know, publicly in a, in a media interview, the following, I'll quote him. He said, so far, 
We have not fought a battle to remove the US from the state apparatus in Lebanon, of course, but if the right day comes and we engage in this battle, the, Liban the battle, the Lebanese will witness something else. End of quote. Uh, <clears throat> of course, within the Taliban, we're seeing a, a division between moderates and extremists. The moderates are trying, and I think it was mentioned before, they are trying to seek legitimacy on the international stage. Uh, they're trying to project an image of civility and, you know, kind of rebranding themselves. Uh, but there's also another part of Taliban that is uh, extremely radicalized uh, and, uh, you know, uh, very, very brutal, I would say. Uh, and my fear is that if the moderates in, uh, within Taliban are not able to deliver and meet the demands and the expectations of the Afghanis in terms of provision of services and, you know, economic growth, etc., then uh, the takeover of the hawkish part of Taliban will even make it uh, further, more complicated in the region. So uh, by all means, what happened in Afghanistan had some implications on how uh, these movements in the region are trying to shape their discourse uh, and to boost their popularity and actually beyond this to, uh, to, uh, to surge their recruitment efforts. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, maybe we have some time for you to elaborate a bit, a bit more on uh, the geopolitical um, consequences, the geopolitical impact of the Taliban uh, comeback in Afghanistan in the, in the Middle East. There are um, uh, Middle Eastern countries which are uh, being uh, increasingly involved in the, Afghan, uh, the Afghan scenario, uh, like Turkey, uh, Qatar, then uh, Afghanistan somehow is part of the so-called uh, broader uh, Middle East, uh, it involves uh, Iran and both countries. So uh, what is your uh, take on, uh, on, the, on the geopolitical uh, impact uh, of the recent events in Afghanistan in the Middle East and North Africa? Yes, thank you. Uh, good question. So, uh... I mean, uh, we've seen, uh, and some people were even surprised by the extent of the relationship that some countries already had with the Taliban. You know, we knew that Qatar, for example, had a relationship. They were trying to mediate between the Taliban and the Americans. Uh, but in the last few weeks, we've realized that some countries were even, you know, having even more developed relationships with the, with the Taliban. You know, Turkey is one of them. Uh, it might not be a surprise, but Iran, very few people knew that Iran had, uh, you know, uh, this kind of relationship with the Taliban, or at least with part of the Taliban. Uh, China and Russia. Russia was also, I mean, for some people in the region here, we did not really see how and why Russia would establish uh, relationships with the Taliban. But now, uh, or at least, I mean, not absolutely, but like uh, the, way, uh, the way we discovered that Russia has these relationships now was a bit of a, of a surprise. So, uh, but nevertheless, I think that, uh, uh, you know, the takeover of Taliban will constitute a, I wouldn't say a threat, but a major source of concern to Russia, and I think this will uh, force Russia to reconsider its agenda in the Middle East, not in a radical way. I'm not expecting them to withdraw from Syria or other places where they're trying to, you know, to, to have their influence asserted, but definitely their resources will have to be carefully managed. You know, the resources they're putting in the region, uh, especially when it comes to intelligence assets, you know, military units, et cetera, will have to be uh, slightly or carefully uh, revisited given, given what's happening uh, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, China, I think, uh, will not be affected too much. China has always the economic uh, card to play. And uh, I, I can easily see how the moderate part of Taliban will have to, uh, to court uh, China a little bit and make sure they, you know, kind of a charm is offensive between China and the, and the Taliban, at least the moderate part, so that, uh, you know, Taliban has some sort of uh, economic relationship and support, uh, which will help them, as I said before, deliver on the, to, to deliver, you know, on some services and uh, economic uh, aspects. Uh, so, of course, China might be worried a little bit by uh, the, 
you know, how the Muslim minority uh, they've been oppressing for some time now will be affected by the by the Taliban takeover. But overall, I guess the economic card will prevail, and I see you know more or less uh, collaborative relationship between uh, Taliban and China. Uh, Turkey, uh, we all know that Turkey had a relationship with the Taliban, and because of the ideological background of the president in Turkey, uh, I think that uh, Turkey will be called to play a bigger role in the region. Uh, we've seen how the UAE, for example, uh, attempted a kind of a rapprochement with Turkey after the takeover of Kabul. Uh, because the, some GCC countries uh, always resorted to actual, you know, securing uh, their own uh, countries uh, through uh, uh, consensus, through agreement with, uh, with Taliban and other groups. And now Turkey can play this uh, go-between role between uh, UAE or Saudi Arabia even and the Taliban to make sure that, uh, you know, these countries do not become a target uh, by, by Taliban. Uh, so uh, I, I see that Turkey's posture in the region will be uh, boosted a little bit because of this role, uh, especially, uh, as I said, the UAE, it was very obvious that they reached out to the Turks. Uh, the Saudis probably did not reach out to the Turks. I think they're trying to play it out through the Pakistanis. Uh, but definitely all of this will mean that countries like UAE and Saudi Arabia will have to uh, reconsider uh, the extent to which they would like to confront uh, Turkey and other GCC countries like Qatar, for example, in some countries. In the last few years, I'm sure everyone, uh, you know, witnessed uh, in some cases very strong, very aggressive competition, I would say, between UAE slash Saudi Arabia and the other uh, and the other axis, which is Qatar and Turkey in some North African countries or other places. So I think this will be put to uh, to bed a little bit. Uh, for a while to see how all of uh, the developments in Afghanistan have played out. Uh, uh, when it comes to Iran, as I said, uh, Iran has established uh, relationships with Taliban. Uh, I, I can definitely see that Taliban is uh, or may, may pose a tactical threat to the Iranians, but I don't see a strategic threat uh, in this, you know, at this level. I, I think the Iranian regime has managed to cultivate uh, some sort of a pragmatic relationship with some key Taliban uh, components or figures. Uh, and now they're using them to actually uh, uh, diffuse the pressure on, uh, you know, on their border. Uh, a direct, uh, a direct uh, involvement of Taliban in the Middle East, I think, especially in the Levant, might be really difficult. I don't, I don't think they have uh, you know, a direct presence. So, any, any implication uh, at that level will be through proxies or through, uh, uh, through mind, uh, you know, uh, through similar, you know, similar organizations, I would say, uh, like-minded like organizations. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I'll stop here and happy to answer questions later on. Thank you. Thank you for your, uh, your broad geopolitical landscape and to conclude, uh, you mentioned so many countries and organizations, but uh, uh, there is the elephant in the room, uh, which means the United States. Uh, what do you think about uh, uh, the, the future of the United States uh, in the region? Uh, what, what impact uh, the Taliban come back in Afghanistan had on the United States in the Middle East and on and the United States relations with, uh, with the Middle Eastern countries, the Gulf countries? Uh, please, yeah. Dr. Ali, really in a nutshell, because I'd like to give the floor to a question from the audience. Sure, sure. Uh, well, two, two main ideas on the United States. First of all, uh, there's no single policy from the United States. You have the military who have their own concerns because of what happened versus the State Department slash White House, who have a different set of calculations that they usually use. Uh, so I can elaborate on this further, but given the limitations of time, I'll stop here. The other, the other important thing to, is that the, the perception, the image of the United States and the Middle East uh, has been severely damaged because of what happened in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and because this is not the first time, we've seen what happened in northeastern Syria before, uh, you know, with the Turkish military operation, and how the Kurds reacted to this, and what happened with the Iraqi Kurds, etc. So there, are, there is now a sequence of events 
that uh, created this perception that the United States is not a reliable ally, that the, you know, these groups or these uh, communities have to reach out to different uh, regional and international powers to secure their interest and protection. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali. I think that we can start with the discussion time if there are uh, other questions from the, from the audience, Mattia. Yes, I have uh, already three questions on, on the chat. Um, and I'm going to read. Uh, the first one is directly for Mr. Raj. Um, and I will please um, uh, ask to all our um, speakers to, uh, to be really concise, if possible. So, Mr. Raj, do you think that the Taliban victory has given more power to the Muslim Brotherhood affiliated groups and, in general, to Islamist? also non-violent and sympathizer groups in Europe, thus allowing them to manipulate and radicalize the Islamic community around the EU countries? And if yes, how do we, how do EU countries can counter these groups? And this question is from Francesco Bergoglio. You have to understand that the Muslim Brotherhood is uh, not a terrorist organization under the European Union. It has been removed as a terrorist organization. So it all depends on countries' uh, um, authentication or the uh, 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 listing of a terrorist organization. However, I must tell you that um, the operations of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, I was in Egypt uh, on the invitation of the Muslim Brotherhood, and I understand their narratives. Um, so uh, the issue is that they will actually uh, propagate and use uh, the victory of Taliban for their own purposes. Depending on how they actually uh, provide the narratives in Europe depends on the uh, religious centers, the mosques who are being operated by the Muslim Brotherhood uh, on, the, uh, on the activities. So as far as Europe is concerned, the Muslim Brotherhood is not listed as a terrorist organization. However, I think the United <laughs> States uh, still recognize it and Egypt also recognizes it as a listed terrorist organization. So it, it, it can be a, a legal issue of uh, claiming uh, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization, but uh, it all depends on who is saying uh, what and how it is being propagated within the European Union. I think that would, would have interesting consequence to declare the Muslim Brotherhood illegal, not to mention in the forthcoming election in Libya, for instance. Um, uh, Dr. Abawan, any thoughts on, on this question? Um, might be not your precise area of expertise, but nonetheless would like to hear your views if you, if you feel like expressing them. No, no, nothing to add to what Mr. Raj said. Thank you. Okay, so I'll move to the second question, which is more of a general question and is from uh, um, Victor. Uh, Islam sees itself as a religion of moderation and Sharia is a law which seeks equilibrium and adaptation to human possibilities. Um, how do we understand this in the light of growing radicalization? And I'll say we go first with uh, Dr. Habawan and then we go to Mr. Raj. Yes, thank you. Uh, I guess, I mean, this is a quite a complex uh, question that, uh, you know, many scholars and many experts have tried to uh, find answers to, but I don't think anyone has succeeded. You know, the facts are that, uh, uh, separ you know, the separation between uh, the public sphere and the private sphere uh, is not something that many Muslims look at very positively. Uh, you know, there is a clear text in the Quran that says that uh, Islam is a state, is, I mean, is a state, uh, is, is a government, is a way to govern and the religion at the same time. So at Islam, Deen, Wadawla, this is how it's spelled out. It's very clear. And I know a lot of moderate Muslims who are not at all radicalized, who believe that this is something they should adhere to. Uh, so uh, what I want to emphasize here is that uh, the mixture between government and religion in Islam is not uh, exclusive to the radicalized Muslims. It is something that many moderate Muslims think uh, that is, uh, you know, is uh, dictated by their religion. So approaching this question uh, using the, you know, stereotypes uh, that we've seen in, in some countries in Europe, other places, I think will be dangerous and will antagonize these moderate Muslims. So what needs to be done is to see how 
you know, how to accommodate uh, this, whether we like it or not, this is something that exists in the Quran. So uh, I think any solution, or any, uh, any answer to the question has to accommodate this uh, reality. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Mr. Raj. Uh, I will agree with Dr. Ali uh, because uh, we, we are sitting on a thin red line here. Um, so people will tend to want to comply to the Sharia uh, laws as well. So we need to understand how it fits between, uh, you know, a radical mindset or non-radical mindset and how it fits. Um, as we see in, in the common law in, in the British uh, uh, constitution, common law is practiced in, in commonwealth countries as well as in certain countries outside of the Commonwealth. Uh, so Sharia laws are, are, are not common laws. It is all dictated by who is in control and who decides how the Sharia interpretations of the legal system should be. So we don't have a concrete uh, Sharia uh, precedence uh, set globally. It is a, a, a mindset of how it is and how it will work depending on who is in control of uh, the, the nation state. So that's how, and I would agree, it, it's, a, it's like, a, like Dr. Ali was saying, it's a, it's a thin red line. Um, if, if you kind of like mess up on this side, you have the moderates uh, kind of going against uh, uh, you for addressing certain issues, which are in line with the Quranic uh, teachings. Uh, thank you, Mr. Raj. Uh, by the way, coming back to the topic that we touched upon before, um, actually, Austria was the first European country to declare the Muslim Brotherhood a terrorist organization. So now there have been uh, questions for the European Council. Uh, I mean, like the European Council is now in the in the in the position to uh, include the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization in the European Union list. Uh, officially. Uh, moving to um, another question that we have from the chat um, from Siham Jebbi. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. Um, Siham is, uh, is saying that the broader underlying question that has been underlying in all the three interventions is, should the European Union and EU member states and other Western states have ties with violent dictatorship to preserve some strategic interest. And somehow, like, this is a question, like, uh, uh, where do we draw the line uh, between uh, strategic interest and fighting terrorism? Because sometimes the two things are also overlapping. Maybe first the Dr. Ali, and then we go again to Mr. Raj. Sorry, I didn't hear the question. If uh... So Siham was asking, the brother on the, 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 should the EU and EU member states and the West in general uh, have ties with violent dictatorship to preserve some strategic interest? And what I was adding to this uh, provocation was also that sometimes like the strategic interests are also overlapping with uh, the, the, um, the necessity to fight, uh, to fight terrorism, but still the Western states are faced with this dilemma. Yeah, well, I'm afraid that, uh, you know, our answers in this forum will not affect how, you know, governments in general approach this issue. Uh, but the reality is, you know, governments uh, seek relationships uh, to, to secure their interest, uh, you know, and adopting a, an extreme approach by saying they shouldn't be in relationship, I think, is not realistic as much as I like to see it, but it's not realistic. So usually the, you know, my, uh, my advice or my opinion, my point of view on this is that, uh, yes, governments have to establish these relationships. They are important, but at the same time, I've seen several situations whereby a conditional relationship has produced some uh, impact. Uh, I've seen this in Lebanon, I've seen this in Iraq in other places. So the EU can maintain these relationships because they have security concerns, they have other strategic interests, but I think the EU can be more assertive in putting some conditions and making these relationships conditional on, uh, you know, at least uh, minimal requirements. Uh, and this is where uh, I see kind of a, a setback, uh, especially, for example, if I follow a little bit, uh, you know, how some EU countries are appro approaching the relationship with Syria, uh, it's really it's really bad that uh, they're going that far with the Syrian regime without uh, making it conditional. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Ali. Agreeable with Dr. Ali. What we say here is not going to change any political uh, mindset of a government. Uh, that's why I'm always saying that we, we as terrorism scholars and researchers, we need to be steadfast in what we do. And doesn't mean a government uh, you know, proclaims uh, recognition. Uh, we have to follow it just because it has to be. And uh, I, I think that there should be uh, you know, some sort of guidelines in what we're doing. Just like uh, North Korea, many countries have a relationship with them and, and it all depends on the strategic part of it. So uh, you're talking about international relations, strategic counterparts, you know, resources and stuff like that. Uh, we as terrorism researchers, we, we have to look at the, the uh, terrorism part of it, the violations that, that's taking place and, and how terrorism is actually growing and radicalization. We're not politicians to decide, but then again, uh, if we are going to be politicians, then we better be master of everything and, and, and you know just about anything we can decide. But like I said, we got to be steadfast in who we are and what we are instead of just bandwagoning just because a European country or, or Saudi Arabia decides that hey, we want to we want to recognize uh, the Taliban, but you know. If we just go ahead by that, uh, we're just wasting our time in addressing uh, root causes of uh, radicalization and extremism or even uh, religious uh, issues. Thank you, Mr. Raj. We have an interesting question about Mozambique and the spreading of um, Islamist terrorism in Sub-Saharan Africa. Unfortunately, Professor Issa had to uh, leave us for um, an unexpected problem. Um, but if our speakers agree, I'll, I'll still pose the question to them. Um, the question is, as you know, um, Islamic State has expanded its presence in uh, in West Africa. We have a province which is the uh, the province that is based in uh, Somalia, but is also expanding in DRC and in Mozambique. Although the links between uh, the Islamist insurgency in Cabo Delgado and Islamic State are still to be definitely proven, but do we um, do you think like Islamic jihadist terrorism in Africa is in expansion still? And do you think it will be in expansion also because of what happened in Afghanistan or or not? Uh, maybe this time first, uh, Mr. Raj. Well, acting as the advisor to the Somalian government, we, we are seeing radicalization take precedence uh, in Somalia. And uh, of course, in the neighboring uh, states, of course, Kenya, where Al-Shabaab is propagating uh, uh, Islamist ideologies. Um, there, are, there are many schools uh, which are run by Islamic states in the region uncontrolled by the Somalian authorities. So we are, uh, we, we are seeing uh, the, the realization of what's transpiring with the Taliban is actually being incorporated into um, radicalization and uh, Islamist ideology uh, being propagated uh, within uh, the uh, uh, African region, and in particular, Somalia, for that matter. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Dr. Ali? I'm afraid I don't have uh, expertise in this uh, part <laughs> of the world at all, so I'll... Uh... I'll skip and uh, blindly agree with Mr. Raj. This is very, this is very, actually, it's very good of you. I mean, it, tell, it tells a lot about your professionalism. Uh, I've been told that Professor Issa is back with us, but I actually, I cannot see him, in, uh, I cannot see him connected. Uh, Emiliano, maybe you see him? Yeah, I can see him. Actually, with another name. It's not uh, his uh, actual name, but uh, with uh, F-A-L-S-H. U-M-A. Can you see him? Mm, not really, but Professor, can you hear me? Professor Issa. Professor Sabu. I'm hearing you. Yes, so we have a question for you. And the question was like, of course, we are witnessing an expansion of um, the jihadist um, terrorism in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, not only um, thanks to the activity, to increase the activity of Al-Shabaab, Al-Qaeda affiliated in, uh, in Somalia, but also um, to groups um, reportedly linked to the Islamic State in Mozambique and in DRC. Uh, do you see the terrorist threat in sub-Saharan Africa expanding uh, also as an effect of what happened in Afghanistan or not? Yeah, what uh, we can observe, of course, is that uh, terrorist activity is expanding, especially in Central Africa and uh, 
region with Mozambique, uh, Eastern DRC, and uh, elsewhere. And in many um, meetings, uh, security uh, companies and security uh, offices used to uh, uh, say that uh, maybe it could uh, expand more due to the fact that uh, borders are not uh, that uh, really well controlled and that, uh, of course, there are many youth getting out from these terrorist groups uh, here and then moving to other locations uh, there. But uh, what I think is that uh, it's not really connected to uh, uh, the Al-Qaeda situation, but it is a transformation of uh, other kind of violence which were already existing. That is uh, a, a kind of linkage between criminal activities and terrorist uh, uh, activities. And secondly, uh, community-based uh, violence, which is shifting to uh, terrorist uh, activities as well. As you uh, could see it in, uh, in Mali, with uh, these different ethnic uh, uh, groups, ethnic affiliation groups, you have the same situation in the border with Central African Republic, with the Moro uh, community. You have the same situation, uh, uh, you can see also uh, in other areas where uh, what, what you can term uh, uh, an aggregation of uh, uh, sedentary and pastoralist groups fighting. Uh, uh, for natural resources and then transforming into other things that uh, really ethnic uh, warfare. So as, as I mentioned before, uh, it is the transformation or the change in uh, the uh, existing uh, violent relations, conflict, security problems that is using terrorism and an opportunistic uh, uh, context to uh, uh, perform activities which are not, we are qualified to be terrorists, but uh, sometimes they are more or less uh, retaliatory activities towards the, the, the elite. But of course, uh, we should not neglect the fact that um, uh, these organizations are trying through different sales in uh, the cities and in areas where there are natural resources and disputed land, disputed uh, politics, they are trying to uh, pave their way there. Uh, thank you, Professor. I think this is also the interesting link between two very different areas like the Sahel and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, in this case, Mozambique. Uh, there are many uh, common points. Um, I have another okay, question. Can I just add on something? Uh, this came yes, please. In, uh, this came in just last week from a, a, a real, <laughs> Well, a known source from Afghanistan. Uh, there is some sort of a play whereby you know the Taliban might take over ISIS. That means by alienating uh, the leaders of uh, ISIS K in Afghanistan and roping them into uh, the Taliban counterpart. And it seems like uh, Al Qaeda is trying to orchestrate this. And um, we we could see the use of ISIS K now. Uh, in attacks with uh, different countries trying to operate within uh, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, they may go after the Chinese for that matter, but uh, something very, very uh, uh, important that popped out last week in, in one of the conversations on how the Taliban might uh, just win over ISIS-K. Interesting and worrying perspective, I would say. Um... Thank you for thank you for this uh, for this, Mr. Raj. Uh, I'll go to the last question. I don't know if in Rome uh, there are any questions, Emiliano. Otherwise, I go with this uh, last one, and then we. Are questions? No, no, I, think, I don't think there are questions here from the from the public. And uh, maybe if we have other questions that they have sent have sent us. Uh, Yes. Um, so actually, the question is uh, for Dr. Eli, but um, I think we can we can expand it also to uh, Mr. Raj. And the question is, what is your opinion on the future uh, relations be, um, between Pakistan and the Taliban uh, movement? And how do you see the development of the triangle, China, Pakistan, Taliban slash Afghanistan? 
Sure. Yes, I thank would, you. I would say that there is also like a name that we didn't mention so far, and uh, it's quite important, I would say, and it's India. Yeah, uh, again, this is this is an area that I don't have uh, a lot of expertise in, but I, I'd like to focus on the second part of the question, which is actually something that is uh, related to the region here, to the MENA region, is that China looks at Pakistan and Afghanistan right now as, you know, uh, or they look at what happened in Afghanistan as an opportunity to boost their uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, uh, which obviously extends to the MENA region in one way. Uh, so uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm definitely seeing uh, China deploying some efforts uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, they, uh, they contain what's happening in Afghanistan and they try to establish positive relationships with whoever ru is ruling Afghanistan. Uh, for the for many purposes, for many reasons, but one of them is definitely uh, what they see as a booster to their Belt and Road Initiative. Thank you. Mr. Raj, any thoughts on this? You're muted. Uh, on, the, on the Pakistani issues, I think the Pakistani uh, government uh, should come out uh, clearly on the issues pertaining to uh, the operations of Talib Pakistan Taliban on the border. Um, in, in the early 80s, where Mujahideen was fighting, um, uh, we are in contact with ex-Mujahideens from Southeast Asia. And most of them came from Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Southern Thailand, and they actually flew out from uh, uh, Malaysia heading to um, uh, Moscow and from Moscow took a flight directly to Peshawar. So they are all border, uh, uh, what you call this Taliban camp set up by the Afghans. And each camp has each country individual doors there. So Hambali operated, Hambali is in Guantanamo Bay, he operated uh, in one of those camps. So, you know, Malaysia had a camp, Indonesia had a camp. So the Taliban had a dose of all the Mujahideens operating there. And uh, in sense of these issues, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, Pakistan is doing a great job uh, when I was briefed uh, by the intelligence community on, on the border. But of course, you know, uh, corruption does exist in, in many governments and, uh, you know, they, they need to address it themselves. Uh, um, you know, they are the only ones, you know, as much as I've seen the, the uh, issues pertaining to the Pakistani involvement in countering the threats of uh, the uh, Taliban, you'll be amazed to see what has transpired uh, with the Pakistani authorities. However, there are also the lack of uh, uh, controls in, 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 in corrupt practices. Thank you. And um, I will go with the last question. Um, the last question comes from the director of the NSA, uh, NSFACOS, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, supporting credible intermediaries to promote dialogue and reintegration might foster trust, tolerance, and respect for diversity. However, how co who could be a credible mediator in a context characterized by a profound gap in intergenerational community, a communication generated by modern technology? And I think this, this time we have to go first to Mr. Raj. Do you want me to repeat the question? Because you, you're you muted again. I'm OK. I thought uh, Emiliano will, will uh, underline this question because it, you know, it, it all boils down to uh, interreligious dialogue and, and uh, people wanting to, to engage in it. But I, I will leave it to Emiliano to answer this, though. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, let me read the question properly first, but then I, before uh, re replying, I want to uh, make clear uh, that this question was posed by uh, the director of the NATO Center of Excellence, uh, Strategic Force Assistance, Colonel Antonio Di Pietro, which I, uh, thank, uh, I want to thank him very much for, uh, for, for posing this question and for, uh, for being with us. So, uh, uh, regarding uh, interreligious dialogue and integration, uh, I, I Personally, I think that uh, uh, we need to um, establish a kind of uh, cultural br uh, bridge uh, with, uh, uh, with the Taliban dimension uh, right now. If you look at, at the situation from the political science perspective, uh, 
Uh, I think that uh, uh, the Taliban uh, represents a kind of extremist uh, ultra conservatism. And if we uh, address it uh, from this point of view, uh, we can uh, also uh, find uh, the proper ways to uh, uh, approach them at cultural and uh, ideological level. And uh, if we just uh, 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 stick to uh, the you know, mainstream narratives of, uh, about the fact that there are ex extremist groups and uh, 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 of course they uh, uh, support uh, um, violent uh, Sharia compliance and so on, that's true, but we need to understand why from the political science uh, uh, perspective. And um, I think that uh, there is a lot of work that we should be doing um, in this regard, in, uh, in this field, and I don't know uh, if, uh, at least in Europe, we are still uh, ready to, to do this on a, on a cultural and scholarly uh, level. Perhaps in the Middle East and in, uh, in Asia, scholars, experts, and practitioners are already uh, more prepared to uh, engage the Taliban uh, culturally, ideologically, uh, because uh, more or less, they are more used to uh, uh, live in a, a conservative or ultra-conservative context, while here in Europe we are uh, going uh, toward uh, ultra-progressivism, and perhaps we have, there is, there is a, a big uh, gap uh, between the two uh, sides at cultural level that should be uh, somehow uh, addressed. Uh, in order for us to better understand uh, what are the Taliban stances and uh, uh, act uh, accordingly according to uh, our, our values uh, and uh, principles and as well as uh, strategic interests. Thank you, Emiliano. And uh, our friends from NATO will excuse me, but I guess the Zoom name doesn't help uh, people who are not familiar with their acronym. So excuse me for that, but we are indeed very happy to have you with us. And actually this was uh, the last question. Um, so our panel is coming to an end. Again, from my side, uh, um, it was a pleasure to have you here and it was a pleasure to uh, host you and uh, to provide room for a very necessary dialogue on this issue and bringing together different perspectives and uh, also doing something that in Europe maybe for many years we have not been uh, uh, too used to, which is also to listen to perspectives that are not our own perspectives. And I think in these, the work um, and dedication that the religion and security country uh, council has showed uh, it's it's uh, very important, and as uh, the Gaspari Foundation, we are very happy to partner up with them and to and to and to create initiative like this one. Uh, so again, thank you all. And for the final words on this, I leave the floor to Emiliano in Rome. Thank you, Mattia, and uh, thanks to President Fano and the Gaspari Foundation for this uh, for this great opportunity for this um, uh, intellectual exchange. It was not only an exchange in terms of uh, information and, uh, and knowledge, but also at uh, intellectual and cultural level. I think that everybody uh, uh, now uh, can uh, feel more uh, enriched and with more uh, uh, tools to, 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 uh, address, and to understand, to address to, to, uh, the situation in, uh, in Afghanistan regarding the Taliban. But, uh, radicalization and violent extremism more uh, uh, more broadly. So I look forward to uh, new activities in this regard, and I hope that this can be uh, just the beginning of uh, of a new process uh, that uh, you know can uh, lead us to uh, to uh, meaningful and valuable policy recommendations to uh, submit to the attention of the decision makers here in uh, in Europe. For, uh, for our common good and for the safety of uh, our European countries. So uh, thank you very much again to uh, the Gaspari Foundation. I'm proud to partner with them as a chairman of the Religion and Security Council. And uh, I look forward to our next event together. Thanks to our uh, speaker, uh, our speakers from, from, uh, from Asia, uh, Africa, and the uh, Middle East, uh, Mr. Raj, Professor Sabu, and Dr. Elia Tuaun for your, for your time. And, uh, and engagement with us. Uh, a special, 
A special recommendation for everyone uh, to stay tuned with the event that both the uh, Legion Security uh, Council and the Foundation will organize in the future on these topics. Uh, you're very welcome to visit our website. And uh, I'm not sure for the Religious Security Council, but uh, I think you have a, um, um, a mailing list. And uh, so you're very welcome to register to the mailing list of both the Religion um, and Security Council and uh, the Gasperi Foundation. Thank you very much again to everyone.